The table below shows the results obtained from an experiment to determine the vapor pressure. They're probably going to ask us to define it. Oh, so they always do that. Okay, so to determine the vapor pressure of different straight chain primary alcohols. Okay, so we've got primary. Oh, there's a little bit of things we can unpack here we, together. We can talk about vapor pressure. We can talk about um, primary alcohols. Okay, so... But let's just let's just first see as we go because I'm gonna go on a whole bunch of tangents. And we're not supposed to be doing tangents because this isn't paper two maths. Okay, so let's just quickly see something here. Um, okay, so they've given us a whole bunch of alcohols. Okay, I'll show you, it's pretty basic. So here we've got a one carbon alcohol, three hydrogens with an OH on it. That's what that is. Then here we've got a two carbon alcohol. So boom, boom, and then an OH and then a whole bunch of hydrogens. Here we've got three carbons, one, two, three, with OH, and then you get the idea. Four carbons, five carbons, six carbons. Fantastic. Then they've given us the different vapor pressures. We'll definitely have to talk about all of that um, as we go along. The first question says, define the term vapor pressure. So before we define it, let me explain it. So what we have is, okay, so let's say we are, um, let's make it easy. Let's say we're busy cooking food, okay? Well, we're busy boiling water at least for now. So here we've got a stove, stove top, and we need a pot. So here's our pot. Now our pot has a lid. Okay, so that's our lid. And in our pot, we begin with water, okay? Liquid water. So let's do it like that. Right. We then apply heat, there's our heat. And slowly but surely, even before the water begins to boil, we will already start to see, well you wouldn't see it because the lid's closed, but we should know that little molecules of water are gonna convert from the liquid phase into the gas phase, even before boiling, even before boiling. So Kev, okay, you're telling me that water can turn from a liquid to a gas before it even boils, bro, that's mad. Yeah, well, it's actually very obvious. I mean, if you go look at your swimming pool, if you had to leave your swimming pool without any pool cover and you leave it throughout summer, the water level will drop. It's not boiling. If you had to climb in there, you're not gonna like burn. But what happens is that we've got evaporation. And so evaporation is just when the, the liquid molecules on the surface of the water gain enough energy to escape and turn into a gas. Boiling is when you are doing it on a much higher level and all of the molecules are at the right, or like all of the molecules are boiling and converting into gas. Whereas evaporation is just a surface level tendency. Okay, but that's besides the scope of what we're talking about here. So, okay, so we've got these, these water molecules and as soon as you start supplying a bit of energy, they start converting into the gas phase. So slowly but surely, we begin to form some type of vapor, okay? That's where we're starting to get to, vapor, pressure. And so we've got some of these molecules that are turning into gas. So this is in the liquid phase, and then this is the gas phase. Now, this, these gas molecules, they're gonna be bouncing around in the, on the sides of the container, okay? They're gonna be, they're gonna be uh, moving around as gas molecules do, and that's gonna exert a force on the container walls, and that is pressure. Pressure is just the force exerted over an area. So, and that's why it's called vapor, because it's in the gaseous, like vapor phase, and it's a type of pressure. So, the definition is the following. It is the pressure exerted by a vapor in equilibrium with its liquid. So we've got a vapor and we've got a liquid and we wait until they reach equilibrium and then we measure the pressure. So a vapor in equilibrium with its liquid. You know, here's an important part. In a closed system. That's why I put the lid on, right? You wouldn't be able to get a vapor pressure if the lid was off, because if the lid was off, the gas molecules would just be like, see ya, I'm out of here. But because we've confined them, we can actually begin to detect or measure a vapor pressure. Okay, so it's the pressure exerted by a vapor in equilibrium with its liquid in a closed system. 
write down a suitable conclusion for this investigation. Okay, well, geez, that's pretty, like they're asking us for the end of the story before we've even read the book. So let's first talk about what's actually going on here. So we said that this is a one carbon, this is a two carbon, three carbon, okay? So if we look at a one carbon alcohol, and we put another one carbon alcohol, because remember, this is all about intermolecular forces, vapor pressure, it's all got to do with intermolecular forces. So that's a one carbon, this would be CH3OH. Uh, now, if we had to look at this one, for example, it has two carbons in the main chain. So there, and then the rest is all hydrogen. And then let's draw another one over here. There, 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 there. Now, we know that in this area over here, there are London force intermolecular forces, okay? And over here, London forces. Then with the OH parts, that's where we're gonna start getting hydrogen bonding. However, that's gonna be a constant throughout the experiment, the hydrogen bonding, why? Well, if you look at all of them, they all have one OH. So the only thing that's actually changing is the length of the carbon hydrogen part. And that part over there is only London forces. So as we increase the length, then what happens is that you have a larger uh, chain length. So you've got a larger surface area for the London forces to act. And the longer you make it, uh, because there's going to be more London forces, the intermolecular forces actually end up becoming stronger. This is not the answer, but I just want to make some notes for you. So as the chain length increases, the molecule surface area increases, which allows more intermolecular forces, or let's rather say the surface area increases, um, causing intermolecular forces to be stronger. Okay, so here the intermolecular forces are going to be a lot stronger than this one, for example, because of that longer, uh, there's more surface area, so we've got more space over which, where the intermolecular forces can act. For example, if you've got three, if you've got four carbons, can you see how much more space we have for intermolecular forces compared with over here? So because you've got more space or surface area exposed, the intermolecular forces are overall going to be much stronger. So then, if you then had, uh, this is going to be really cool, if you then had a container filled with, let's say for example, C3H7OH, so C3, and then obviously I always like to show two of them because that's what intermolecular forces are all about, um, with an OH, Okay, then here's another one. Okay, so we've got our container and we've got our uh, lid. There's our lid. Then if we had another little container filled with this one, CH3OH, and then of course we're gonna have a lid. Okay, now what you've got to think of is Think about the intermolecular forces inside here, in between these two molecules, and then think about the intermolecular forces here, and think about which ones are stronger. So, ooh, I just erased, oh, now all the water's gonna spoil all over the floor. Sorry, guys, man. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's see what happens. So what would happen is that the intermolecular forces here would be much stronger right? So these molecules are holding on to each other much more. Whereas these ones, they're not really holding on to each other that much. 
So which ones will be easier when we start applying heat? Which ones are gonna separate more easily? Well, well done if you said that these ones are gonna separate more easily. And so you're gonna get more of these ones going into the gas phase earlier on compared with these ones, these ones over here. So at equilibrium, which one is gonna have more gas? Well, well done if you said that uh, this one's gonna have a lot more gas because the molecules, because they're easier to separate, they're gonna easily be able to go into the gas phase, whereas here you're gonna have a little bit less, okay? So that means the vapor pressure over here is gonna be higher than the vapor pressure over here. And that's why we can see that as we go down the table, the vapor pressure is becoming less. Because these intermolecular forces are so strong, they very difficult, it's very difficult to take them and turn them into the gas. And so the vapor pressure is very low. Does that make sense? So there's an inverse relationship. As you increase the intermolecular forces, you decrease the vapor pressure. Can you see that? That should make perfect sense. That, that should be a nice, easy one to understand. You may have to just watch and think about this a few times, but once you get it, you'll understand it's a very simple concept. These molecules are so in love that you cannot separate them. You're not gonna be able to separate them very easily. So they not there's not gonna be that many of them going into the gas phase. Whereas these ones, they're having a little bit of a fight and it's really easy to separate these ones because the forces in between them or holding them is not that strong. So turning them into the gas phase is very easy. Okay, so it says write down a conclusion for this investigation. So the conclusion will be vapor pressure decreases with an increase in chain length. So as you increase the chain length, you decrease the vapor pressure. This one, write down the IUPAC name of the alcohol with the highest boiling point. Now, this should all make perfect sense to you. Which of these molecules is going to be the most difficult to boil? What do you do when you boil something? You turn it from a liquid to a gas. So you have to be able to overcome all of those forces. So which ones are gonna be very difficult? Well done if you said it's this one. These ones are gonna be very difficult to separate, whereas these ones are gonna be very easy. So these ones are gonna require a very large amount of energy to be able to pull them apart. Remember, they are very difficult to pull apart because the forces holding them together are strong. So you're gonna need a very high temperature. So that means that these ones are gonna have a high boiling point, meaning that you need a high temperature to separate them. And these ones are gonna have a low boiling point. So can you see that boiling point is inversely proportional to vapor pressure? When boiling point is low, then the things are easy to turn into a gas, so that means the vapor pressure will be high. When boiling point is very high, it means that it's difficult to separate them, so that means that there will be less of them in the gas phase, so vapor pressure will be low. That should make perfect sense. Make sure you understand that. So it says, write down the IUPAC name of the alcohol with the highest boiling point. It's this one over here. So because this is gonna be the answer here, um, we got to know how to how to name it. Now, there are multiple ways you could have drawn this, but you got to remember that they said primary alcohols, and they also said straight chain. So, let's quickly talk about primary, secondary, and tertiary alcohols. So, primary, and then I'll do secondary a little bit further down, actually, and then tertiary. So with primary, it's the most basic type you can get. It's gonna be like that. Why is it a primary? Well, if you look at this, if you, okay, if you look at the OH, then you look at the carbon touching that one, then I want you to look at how many carbons are connected to this one. Well, that would, own, some of you are gonna say two, but I'm talking about directly connected. So that would only be this one over here. And so there's only 
one carbon. That's why we call it primary. If we look at secondary, well, then you're going to get a structure that looks like this. Um, uh, not like that, like that. So look at the OH. Then look at the carbon that's touching that OH. Now, how many carbons are directly touching this one? Well, there's one and there's two. Now with tertiary, well, that's going to look like this. So you're going to have an OH. Okay, I'm going to, ah, come on. It's going to be something like there. Okay, you get that's an OH. And then we're going to put a carbon up here. Tertiary. Okay, so you look at the OH. Then you look at the carbon touching that. Now, how many carbons are directly touching that one? Well, there's one, two, three. And so that's what we call tertiary. So we have primary. So it's going to be a basic one like this, where the alcohol is going to be on carbon number one. So it's a six carbon. So that's going to be um, hex hexan and then alcohols always end with ol but we must say that it's on carbon number one the 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 um the oh and then there's no branches and so that would be the name over there hexan one ol okay this last question says the experiment is now read will repeated at 320 kelvin so it was originally at 300 so they're doing it at a slightly higher temperature now what would well what would happen to the vapor pressure? Well, it's very easy. Think about this. If you add more heat, are you going to cause more molecules to go into the gas phase? How do you get things to go into the gas phase by the way? You have to be able to separate the liquid molecules from each other. And the way you do that is by adding energy. So, if you are now using a higher temperature, that means you're adding more energy. So you're going to have more molecules that are going to be able to now go into the gas phase. So that means that the vapor pressures for all of these will increase. So you're just going to say increase. Because when you add more temperature, you are adding more energy. And that energy will allow more molecules to be separated from each other in the liquid phase to then go into the gas phase and that raises your vapor pressure.